Well, good morning and welcome. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar and CLE focused on vac vaccinations in the workplace. We're going to get started. I, we've got a, a large number of registrants today, and I know a lot of people are um, filing in. But while they do so, um, in the interest of everybody's time and to keep us on schedule, I'd like to kick off our, our webinar this morning. My name is Jason Castor, and I'm the Chief Business Development Officer for the law firm of Parsons, Bailey, and Latimer. And I'd like to welcome you to today's webinar. Considering that we had more than 170 registrants, I'd say this topic is extremely timely and relevant as we try and determine how best to handle this situation. While I wish we were able to conduct this webinar in person and over breakfast, given the current environment, virtual will have to do. So thanks again for taking time out of your busy schedules to be with us this morning. Before I turn the time over to our presenters, I'd like to cover a few quick logistical items. First, today's webinar in CLE is being recorded, and you will be provided a link via email to the recording within 24 hours to share with your colleagues and teams that weren't able to participate today. This email will also include a copy of today's PowerPoint presentation. Second, we'd like today's webinar to be as interactive as possible. So please submit questions using the chat feature throughout this morning's discussion. We've allotted time at the end for Q&A and hopefully we'll have about 10 minutes to address questions. Um, and finally, the most, the important legal disclaimer that I have to, to share with you. Um, today's webinar, um, and I'll just advance our slides so you can see our presenters before I move ahead. Um, today's webinar, um, it, it, it should be considered um, a general source of information and is not intended and is not intended, excuse me, and will not serve as a substitute for legal counsel on these issues. Given the complexity and rapidly changing landscape, you must consult with your legal counsel on these issues. So with that, I'd now like to turn the time over to my colleague, Liz Mellum. Liz is the managing shareholder of the firm's Missoula, Montana office. She concentrates her practice on complex commercial litigation and a wide range of employment law issues. Liz, I'll turn the time to you. Thanks. Thank you, Jason, and thank you all for attending this morning. Um, we are going to be talking to you today about vaccinations and what as an employer and as a business, the considerations for you should be moving forward with your um, with your company. So to start us off, I'm going to go through a few of the overviews of where we are um, currently with COVID-19 and the available vaccines that are um, available to us in the United States. So the information that I'm gonna display is all current as of Monday, February 8th. So the, the information has changed a little bit um, in the intervening days, just know that. We are one year past our first reported COVID-19 case in the United States. That was back on January 20th of 2020. And the first reported COVID-19 death was February 6th. Now. Of course, if you remember back then, um, we thought that the first death was in late February, but an autopsy performed in April on an individual who passed away in early February confirmed that that individual did pass away from COVID-19. So we are more than a year past our first reported death as well. We are at just under 27 million total cases in the United States and just over 460,000 deaths in the United States. So we are clearly still in the throes of this pandemic as we all are experiencing via this webinar, um, both with the hand washing, the face masks, the social distancing and living a lot of our lives virtually now. This is a graphic depiction of the current COVID-19 um, risk levels. There are 30 places um, in the United States right now that are considered at the highest COVID-19 risk level. Of the states that Parsons operates in, it appears to me that only Idaho um, and Colorado are the ones that are at an orange level. The rest of us are red. Um, so that includes Montana, Nevada, and Utah. How our states stack up, our primary states where persons operates, Montana, Idaho, Nevada, and Utah. Um, these are the total cases, total reported cases, and total reported deaths, or confirmed cases and confirmed deaths um, for each state. 
So if you look at um, suspected numbers in each state, they will be higher, but I'm, I gathered the information from each of the reported official sites for each of the states. So as you can see, cases are, um, are rising and are high in each of the states and the total number of deaths are high as well. So what have we been doing this entire time for the last year? We've been doing the Swiss cheese method of protection. Hopefully you've seen this graphic or similar graphic before. And if you're not familiar with it, the Swiss cheese model of virus defense is basically layering one protection on top of another, that a single protection alone, such as physical distancing, is not enough, but multiple protections used together help um, provide a greater amount of protection for each individual. So in this graphic, you can see there's physical distancing, face masks, ventilation, hand hygiene, contract tracing. We now have vaccines. Um, vaccines, of course, the topic of our webinar today are an additional layer of protection. They do not replace all of the other layers. So as of right now, the current information that we have is that the vaccines are one more layer, they're one more piece of protection, but they are not a silver bullet and they do not remove the need for all of the other layers of protection at this time. So a brief over overview of the approved vaccines that are available in the United States. Currently, there are two that the FDA has given emergency use authorization for. Each of those vaccines are what are called mRNA vaccines, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in, um, in a moment. There are three more vaccines that are in phase three clinical trials, which is the very last stage of trials before those um, companies and those vaccines can be applied for emergency use authorization. So the fingers crossed hope is that additional vaccines will be available soon beyond just the current two, but they are not readily available at this moment because they have not finished the clinical trials. So as I'm sure you know, the two that are available right now are the Pfizer um, vaccine as well as the Moderna vaccine. Both of those are mRNA vaccines. They both are administered as a shot in the muscle of your upper arm. And they both are two doses. For the Pfizer vaccine, you have one dose, and then the second dose is 21 days later. For the Moderna vaccine, you have your first dose, and the second shot is 28 days later. Their effectiveness is almost identical. Uh, Pfizer has been shown in clinical trials to be 95% effective after two doses, and Moderna is 94.1% effective after two doses. This information all came from the CDC's website um, and is all based on the scientific and clinical data that was gathered about both of the um, both of the vaccines. Remember too, if you can, from prior um, news outlets and news reports, the hope was that COVID vaccines would be at least 50% effective. So the current vaccines that are available shot that out of the park. We are um, way higher effectiveness and much greater protection than what um, scientists and our health officials were hoping for when these vaccines were previously being developed. So the known current known side effects of both approved vaccines, um, this will be important for you as businesses and as employers to understand so that as you're working through your workforce, receiving um, these vaccines and then reporting side effects, you have an understanding of, of what's to be expected. The most common side effects um, in the arm where you get the shot, very similar to other shots and other vaccines, pain, swelling, and redness. Throughout the rest of your body, there have been reports of chills, tiredness, headache. These are the most common side effects. There are, in extremely rare instances, allergic reactions that occur, um, and those are for individuals who have known severe allergies should absolutely consult with their physician before they receive either of the vaccines. And as well, you know, any of your employees should consult with their physicians if they have any questions about these vaccines. Um, most of these side effects that are reported are mild to moderate, but they are more common after the second dose. 
of the vaccine in each instance or with each vaccine and the ones that tend to occur after the second dose just anecdotally as we've been hearing are the ones that are throughout the rest of your body so chills tiredness headache sometimes a fever um, and those are happening generally after the second dose because of the boost that is being given to your immune system um, when the second shot is administered. So briefly for you to understand how an mRNA vaccine works, again, this information, as with the previous slide, this all comes from the CDC's website, so it is available for you to look up on your own um, and to distribute to your employees if needed. An MRN vac excuse me, mRNA vaccine basically teaches your cells how to trigger an immune response. That immune response produces the antibodies, and then that protects you from getting infected if the real virus enters your, your body. So the benefit of it is that you gain the protection of the vaccination without ever having the risk of getting COVID-19 because the COVID-19 virus is not ever put into the body. Um, prior or older vaccines or different kinds of vaccines some sometimes do input a portion of the virus, not with mRNA vaccines. And the easiest or kind of simplest um, analogy that I've heard about this is that an mRN vac mRNA vaccine is similar to taking a self-defense class. You're taught how to defend yourself. You're taught what to do in the instance if you are attacked, but you're not actually attacked. You're just teaching yourself and your body what to do in the event that that occurs. Um, that's what I've come across as the simplest explanation for this kind of a vaccine. Some of the myths about mRNA vaccines, we're just gonna debunk those real quickly here for you so that you have that information available in case there are questions or concerns um, in your place of business. This vaccine, these types of vaccines cannot give someone COVID-19 because they don't use the live virus. They do not interact with or affect an individual's DNA in any way. This is because the mRNA never goes into the nucleus of the cell, which is where our genetic material is kept. And the cell breaks down and gets rid of the mRNA soon after it's finished using the instructions from the vaccine. So think of it like throwing away the instruction booklet after you've finished building your new Ikea nightstand. You don't need it anymore, and so you toss it. The final um, myth I wanna address with you guys is that for your employees, for yourselves, even if you have had COVID-19 and you've recovered, scientists and our health officials are encouraging everyone to still get in line to get the vaccine. The reason being is that no one knows if, the, if and how long the natural immunity will last from previously having the COVID-19 um, virus in your system. And it is believed currently that the um, mRNA vaccines that are available will provide immunity for longer and a stronger immunity, even if an individual has already had COVID-19. I'm gonna go ahead and throw this back to Jason so that he can introduce our next presenter. Thank you. Great, thank you very much, Liz. We appreciate your time and insights. I'd now like to turn the time over to Amy Lombardo. Amy is a shareholder in the firm's Boise office. She advises clients on a variety of employment law issues and health law regulations, primarily within healthcare, agriculture, and technology industries. Amy, I'll pass the mic to you and let you take it from here. Thank you. Thank you, Jason. Good morning, everyone. So one year ago, approximately in late February, early March, um, Parsons, Bailey and Latimer began um, advising employers on what the heck to do with this pandemic that was coming. Um, I include a snapshot of this article from Idaho Business Week because it's Remarkable um, to remember that around just before March 5th of 2020, we had only 100 cases uh, of COVID-19 in the United States and six deaths. Um, but we began talking about business continuity plans. 
how to keep your business going um, in light of this new reality, um, how to make sure that you can still function. Um, we talk to employers about remote and virtual environments, about testing, about keeping your employees uh, safe. The phase we're now in, obviously, as Liz explained, is vaccination. Um, and what I want you all to uh, take away from this is you should look at vaccinations as part of your overall strategy. So take a look at um, what your business continuity plan already says, what the status is of your employees uh, now, and how are you going to use uh, vaccinations to further reach the goals of your office um, or your workplace? We are going to be talking about a lot of law today. Um, we will not have time to get into all of it. Of course, we will go over the federal statutes and guidance. I will touch on um, some OSHA regulations, some um, EEOC updated guidance. Um, and just as a uh, some baseline information, if you are a um, public employer, so, um, and if you're a private employer, some of the law that you'll look at uh, may differ. An example of this is, um, all of the constitutional laws, the uh, First Amendment, uh, RIFRA, the Religious, Religious Freedom Restoration Act, those um, are likely not going to hinder your ability to um, make vaccinations mandatory, but you need to pay closer attention to them and um, follow the process that you would for other things in, um, you know, documenting how and why you're um, making these changes. Um, the United States Supreme Court case, similarly, Jacob Cern versus Massachusetts, is a 1905 case that is the baseline for vaccination law. It um, also will apply if you you are um, a state or local government, um, but not so much to private employers. So it did uphold uh, a mandatory vaccine ordinance um, and has been the standard um, since since that time. Um, Larry will talk about some of the state law issues, and then just keep in mind that public policy and public opinion does um, have some bearing here as well. So in looking into what first does OSHA say um, about vaccinations and if you can give vaccinations um, to your employees, the first thing that if you've attended any of our seminars over the past year, you will know about the OSHA general duty clause. Um, so, as an employer, you have an, a duty to provide a workplace that is free from recognized hazards that are likely to cause death or serious physical harm. Um, so, what that generally means is even if you're following regulations um, and local laws, you still um, may have some liability if um, there's a COVID case because a COVID case has um, been determined to be a recognized hazard. So you want to do what you can to keep those um, cases out of your workplace. And I'll talk about um, a little bit more on that on, in the EEOC guidance. So OSHA has also um, sent out some new guidance from the new administration, it's um, it's not just on vaccines. It came out January 29th, but it does uh, mention vaccinations, and it does that by describing what the most effective 
COVID-19 prevention programs that they've seen um, include. And they include making a COVID vaccine available at no cost um, to all eligible employees, uh, provide information to employees on the um, benefits and the safety of the vaccinations, as Liz described. Um, and it said, don't make a distinction between workers who are vaccinated and those who are not. And it did note um, that we you need to continue to follow the protective measures, um, all of them, or whichever ones you have in your office at this time, because we have evidence that the vaccines are very effective, um, but not yet that they prevent person-to-person um, -person transmission. So you um, may be protecting people in your office, but not stopping the spread, which is um, somewhat of a difficult distinction to understand. So in looking at the OSHA um, regulations, I also searched for if there's any um, letters or information from OSHA on how they would treat vaccines. And there was a letter response from 2009. Um, it was in response to a, an individual who was writing, who worked in the health industry, who said, um, my employer is um, trying to mandate this flu shot. And the employer threatened to make me take time off um, if I don't receive it. OSHA's response in 2009, and it should be noted that that was the year of H1N1. So this letter was November of 2009. Um, and OSHA responded, we certainly expect our facilities, um, so all um, workplaces, to perform a risk assessment of their individual workplace. And this will be different for um, all workplaces. We um, encourage employers to offer the seasonal and H1N1 vaccines at the time. Um, employees need to be properly informed of the benefits um, and the risks. Um, and that OSHA doesn't require employees to take the vaccines, but an employer may, requ may require vaccines to be taken. Um, and this was in the healthcare industry. Um, of course, they will be um, a much more risky industry for um, infection. So, but the letter did note that um, if there, you have an employee who refuses a vaccination because they have a reasonable belief that they have a medical condition that could make um, them have a serious reaction or, um, you know, that causes them a very real danger that uh, you shouldn't retaliate against them um, because they likely have whistleblower rights under um, whichever statute is relevant to your industry. So a little more on doing a risk assessment for your business. This is all on the OSHA website, but um, basically you look at what types of hazards um, your business will have. If you um, have physically distanced employees who work in an office um, and there's little or limited interaction with the public, you'll be on the lower end of the, um, end of the spectrum and then it goes from there. Um, keep in mind that all of your strategy is going to be subject to what your local health department is doing and how your state decides to distribute the vaccines. Um, I don't think this means that it's too early to think about these issues and decide uh, what we're going to do, but be aware that you know some states are um, further ahead than others and um, that you need to know how you're going to uh, interact with the with the priorities that are set 
and know that your people may not be able to get a vaccine uh, yet. So, and as you're thinking about if you're going to do um, a voluntary versus a mandatory program, just remember that um, there's more than one type of voluntary program. Um, there's also the scenario where you can simply encourage and track the vaccine, um, or you can offer it and administer it. But you should know that if you're going to administer it yourself, you have to become a provider. And there um, is additional uh, guidance and uh, information on, on that. So it might be more likely if you're going to offer it and uh, administer it that you would actually have a third party come in and administer it. Um, something like you would maybe do for flu shots um, in a another year, in a, a more average year, but this will have a little bit um, more of, there are a few more obligations that you need to train on. Um, so either way, you can contact your local officials or you can contact providers directly. You can look into, if you have a big enough space, doing this yourself, um, using a strike team or a closed um, pod to do this. Um, you have to do the physical distancing and um, all of that goes along with it. Um, and just be aware in certain states, when your employee group, and it might be that you have um, a bunch of different groups within your um, employees, when they're up to bat, ready to get the vaccination, if your state requires verification, um, there might be a process where you um, have a letter that you give to them. And uh, just so you know, don't send out um, letters too early. Um, if your people are not able to get vaccinated yet, um, there are stories in the news around um, about people jumping the line and you don't want someone jumping the line with a, an official letter from your office. So uh, next on the EEOC guidance, this came out in mid-December. Um, and noted that if you are simply asking employees to provide proof of their vaccination um, to you, that does not trigger the ADA. Um, it's so if you want to just encourage it and you want your employees to just provide you proof, um, you may want to track that and just request that your employee not provide you any other medical information with the vaccination record. Um, you wouldn't want to receive um, any genetic information or disability information um, that you're not, well, you don't want to inadvertently receive it. If you do, you have to um, do the interactive process if it's required. So, and simply providing a vaccine is also not a disability related inquiry, but what is, is the medical history questions that go along with the vaccination. Um, and it's required that you give these medical history questions um, in order to do the vaccination. So they may go hand in hand, but if you have a third party administrator um, do this, that might help. Um, and then just be aware that um, vaccines, if may be determined to be part of your wellness plan, um, and that ERISA may be triggered. So you might need to send out notices, plan summaries, um, just make sure to be aware of this. You may want to um, contact counsel for this. And um, one more thing that I didn't have on my slides, and then I will um, send it back to Jason, is when you're looking at your individual um, plan, and this is in the EEOC guidance from mid-December, you want to look at your individualized workforce and you look at four things to determine whether a direct threat exists. 
the duration of the risk, the nature and severity of the potential harm, the likelihood that the harm will occur, um, and the eminence of the, of the uh, potential harm. So it's not necessarily that just, um, you know, one case of COVID is gonna be um, a serious problem. Um, many businesses have had those already, um, but it's more of it's, you have to do the work to look at exactly what's going on um, to determine what your next step should be. Um, and with that, I will turn it back over, Jason, back to you. Thank you very much, Amy. Great job. I'd now like to welcome in Susan Mottschiedler. Susan is a member of the firm's litigation and employment teams based in our Salt Lake City office. She represents employers in lawsuits and counsels employers in a full range of employment law matters. Susan, the mic is now yours. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you for attending, and can you see me forward the slides? Yes. Jason, can you see me forward the slides? Yep, it's coming your way. Okay, perfect. Um, so I'm gonna talk about um, mandatory voluntary or no policy. Um, and when we have discussed with em uh, employers so far, we've had basically two questions. Um, one, can we mandate it? And Amy's already talked about that. Yes, you can do it. If you do it in a non-discriminatory manner. Um, so for mandatory vaccines, you have to, and, and actually for um, incentivized policies, um, you do have to offer potential accommodations uh, for the ADA and for Title VII, and then definitely for pregnancy and nursing. The second question is the more difficult question, and it's should we? Um, what should we do? And it depends on the nature of your workforce, um, the nature of your workplace, your tolerance for uncertainty. Um, so I think even though you can legally mandate a vaccines, if you do, um, there are going to be lawsuits, maybe not against you, but I think we're gonna see some lawsuits um, regarding this. They may not have merit, but if they are well pled, it will be difficult to get rid of the lawsuits on, for example, a motion to dismiss. Um, so, uh, and, and there will likely be some other claims. There are also some uncertainty about the types of incentives you can offer. Um, and we hope to have an answer for that sooner rather than later. Um, vaccine availability, it seems to be increasing, um, but as both Amy and Liz pointed out, different states are at different points of their um, distribution plan and your workforce may fall across a number of different phases. And then one of the the greatest unknowns right now is the variants. Um, how are they, how bad are they gonna be? Um, is it going to increase transmissibility? And so your OSHA duty to provide a safe place, a safe work environment, that analysis may change. And the analysis may also change. For example, um, Amy was talking about the ADA considerations, what constitutes um, a risk in the workplace. And then finally, is it possible to have no policy? Uh, we've had a number of people who don't wanna deal with it. And I, I don't think that that's possible. Um, just even by having people ask questions, you have to have an answer. Um, and most of the, the no policy questions have come down to, okay, we want to have a voluntary policy, um, but we can't really offer any incentives to get that done. And so I would encourage you, even if you are not going to have amazing incentives or any incentives, that you have some sort of policy how you're going to deal with this. And it's beneficial if potentially you can say to your workforce, to your customers, hey, you know, 75% of our um, workforce is vaccinated or be able to represent that. So the workforce considerations um, that you're gonna look at to determine wh which policy is best for you, your age of your workforce. And this can go two ways. Um, one way is, if you have an older workforce, they're already getting vaccinated anyway, most likely. Um, on the flip side of that, the other side is if you have an older workforce, are they more at risk for the younger um, people, the younger employees in your organization not getting vaccinated? Uh, the health condition of the workforce, we all know that um, asthma, COPD, obesity, diabetes, these are all risk factors that increase 
um, the risks of COVID. And so if you have a large portion of your um, workforce with those risk factors, you might consider mandating or your risk analysis is going to be different. Um, the living situations of the workforce. And this is both if you provide housing, um, that's actually part of your workplace. And if, um, if you have people living in private housing, but all together, this is really common in agricultural settings and seasonal settings, that sort of thing. And while you can't control what they do in, or you can control in the workplace what they do, masking, physical distancing, you can't in the private home. Um, so that might mitigate, um, or that might make it look more mandatory for you guys. Uh, if you've had prior outbreaks, um, that is something to consider. Is your workforce fungible? Um, I think you can count on some people quitting if you mandate this, um, or that's a risk anyway that you might be willing to face. If you have um, a highly fungible workforce, that's probably not as much of a concern. Um, nobody likes turnover, but you know, if, if it's not a problem and you need to mandate it, then do so. Um, for more skilled workers, um, that are more difficult to replace, you might be looking more at a voluntary um, policy with incentives. You also are gonna be dealing with concerns about um, vaccinations and all of the information that Liz gave you, you can use to address those and address them directly. And my final question I ask people um, is, did you have problems instituting a mask policy? And if you did, um, you're probably going to have problems instituting a vaccine policy if it's mandated. Um, however, uh, as one of the potential future incentives you can offer, it's a maskless future. And again, we don't know. Um, there's a lot of uncertainty around that, um, particularly with the variants, the different um, vaccine uh, efficacy, but it may be something that you can dangle out there. Workplace considerations, um, again, you need to consider your OSHA general duty clause. You should look at the nature of the business. Um, a manufacturing facility is going to have a different risk, um, like a food manufacturing or um, like a meat processing plant, for example. We've had a lot of outbreaks in those facilities. It's going to look different from an office where you can have you know, clear barriers, um, lots of stations to wash hands and sanitize hands and then um, masks. And then ski patrol, let's say. Most of their time is going to be spent outside, and then you have these little pinch points um, inside. But on the flip side, they're also going to be dealing with people who come in from out of state and other areas who are also bringing in um, potentially different variants, um, as well as you know an unknown vaccination level. You need to look at the remoteness of your workforce. And so if you have a workforce out in the middle of nowhere, um, let's say, you have drilling fields and um, chances are you probably also provide them with living quarters. And so you have two factors going on there. They're close, so easy, easy to spread. You have a lot of people living together. Um, and if they bring it in, it is very likely that you're going to have an outbreak. And then the remoteness is potentially going to make it more difficult to get medical attention. Um, so that would be a greater risk for a COVID spread within your workforce. Um, if you've had prior outbreaks, um, that, that gives you a good idea that there is something in your workforce. You know, for example, I talked about manufacturing facilities, um, the closeness, the speed of the work, that sort of thing, which makes your workplace more prone to outbreaks. Um, a mandatory vaccination policy might be appropriate for those types of um, workplaces. And then what measures have you been taking? Does it work? Um, I think we all know that for remote working or for, um, days, uh, like rotating days in when people come into work, these things are working. Um, and there might be an or expectation that you continue those. Um, so it's also something to consider. It is too early to um, enact a mandatory and to force people to get vaccined, um, vaccinated because there's not enough vaccine for all. You can push out that policy, but just anticipate that there's gonna be a spread until everyone can get vaccinated. Um, it is not too early to communicate to employees, um, and, and people are getting the vaccines now. So through emails, um, reinstitute regular communications about COVID and vaccines. Um, you can put posters up, um, send letters to workers and their families. Um, the vaccination will also make families safer. 
Um, and, and I would view all of those avenues as ways to um, communicate about the safety, the efficacy of the vaccine and additional variants that are gonna come out. Um, in the workplace um, posters, we've seen some really great posters based on the CDC information, um, announcements, employee meetings, and then daily morning huddles. Um, those are really good places to, to keep talking about the vaccine and what you're going to be doing as a company. You don't necessarily have to decide exactly at this moment, but you can start communicating, here's what we're thinking about doing and here's why. And then finally, communicating with customers, I think is an important part of this as well. Um, I, I mentioned earlier, if you can uh, communicate how, how much of your workforce is going to be vaccinated and particularly if Part of your workforce is going into people's homes um, or into their private space. That might be a portion of your workforce that you really want to get vaccinated um, and you want to be able to say 100% of the folks that are going to be coming into your home have had a COVID vaccine. Um, the communications also lay the groundwork for whatever policy you're going to um, enact. Um, like Liz said, all of those things can actually go in your policy. Um, as well as um, around the workplace. Um, it's a public policy health issue, the safety of the vaccine, a key component to getting pandemic under control. If it, you're making it mandatory, I advise that you start reworking your job descriptions. So that is in your job description. If you need to advertise for any of the jobs, it's already in there. Um, and then avoid political statements and opinions. Um, this is obviously, I think we can all agree that it's been politicized too much. And it's not going to be helpful either way um, to enact whatever policy you're going to enact. So as I mentioned, um, a lawful policy is going to have uh, accommodations. It's going to be subject to the ADA and Title VII. Um, and it's you just follow your regular ADA accommodation policy, which hopefully you have, <laughs> um, where the employee identifies or the employer finds out of uh, this disability fill out an accommodation request form unless it's an obvious disability um, and you start the interactive process. Um, Amy outlined the, the direct threat assessment that you have to do under the ADA to determine whether or not this person needs to be excluded from the workplace under your policy. Um, you can't exclude the employee until that determination is made. And the risk determination may also change over time. So let's say right now we've had mitigating steps in place um, that have worked, but let's say the variants that come out are far more transmissible and some of the things we're doing like masking is not working or we find out that it's lingering in the air longer, so six feet um, is no longer a sufficient space and you don't have space to have 20 feet in between people. Um, those are the types of things you need to keep looking at. Um, you can also look at what accommodations you can offer without an undue burden, and those can be things you've already been doing, masking, separation from others, remote work. I don't think we're getting rid of that. Um, and leave. Leave um, can be also an accommodation until um, the person is no longer a risk. Additional considerations, um, if you do a mandate of policy, is that there may be people who have uh, disabilities that you don't know about and um, you may not want to know about the disabilities. Um, and likewise, the employee may not want you to know. Um, those are not deal breakers, but they are considerations. Title VII, um, also you have to accommodate uh, religious accommodations under Title VII, particularly for mandatory. Um, I'll talk briefly about voluntary. Um, the religious accommodation threshold is pretty low. It's an easy standard to meet. All you have to show is a sincerely held religious belief, practice or observance um, that would prohibit the employee from receiving the COVID vaccine. And it's a very broad provision. Most of the time, an employee can just come and say, hi, you know, here's my religion, my practice, my observance, here's what it is. And it may be something you don't know about. Um, in that case, you can get a little bit more information. I would tread carefully here. Um, and consult an attorney if, for example, you have an employee that you know darn well is belongs to X religion, you see them in church, they talk about it, and all of a sudden they're saying that they observe Y religion in order to not have to take a vaccine. Um, as I said, tread carefully. <laughs> uh, 
uh, but you you may offer them the same accommodations um, that you would offer um, folks under the ADA. And then the additional consideration is you may not have known about this religion earlier, um, and now you do. So any negative um, action that you take, you could be asking for a Title VII claim. And one of the last things I want to talk about is potential incentives for the policy. And you don't have to limit these just to voluntary policies. You can still have incentives or rewards, if you will, um, for mandatory policies. So cash is king, um, money. I think most of the, the um, surveys that they've done, people, money is the primary motivator. I think that that will change as vaccines become more um, accepted and the efficacy is known. Uh, but right now, money. Um, paid time off for the time to vaccinate. I think that that's a pretty good place to start. Um, you can also offer PTO to use in the future or PTO to use, um, particularly in the case of second doses, where individuals have had um, a greater immune response and maybe don't feel good. Um, you could look at benchmark goals, i.e. if like a certain percentage of your workforce is, or even a division gets vaccinated, um, then everyone gets a bonus or the people who are vaccinated get a bonus. Um, masking in the future, this could be a potential um, reward for getting uh, vaccinated. Right now it's not, you still have to wear masks. Um, but reinstating things like travel conferences, lunches, et cetera, as you are able, um, I think for a lot of people that's a pretty huge incentive as well as the mask. The uh, counterpoint to this is that incentives, the more valuable the incentive, it may signal that the vaccine itself is not itself or it's not itself valuable. I don't worry about that quite as much, um, but again, you know your workforce better and um, you want to tailor your incentives to work for your workforce. And then finally, there are some potential limitations. Um, and even though the EEOC uh, put out guidance regarding vaccines, um, they did not put out guidance regarding whether or not a vaccine policy would fall under the wellness pro or be a wellness program, um, which must be compliant with the ADA and a number of other rules. Previously, if it were a wellness program, um, you could offer a benefit of up to 30% of the cost of individual healthcare coverage without being coercive. Um, that was struck down by a court, the EEOC was ordered to come up with a different rule. In January of 2021, um, there was a proposed EEOC rule that allowed only for a de minimis um, reward, such as a water bottle or like a low value gift card. And I don't think that that's gonna push anyone over the line um, to get a vaccine if they're not gonna get it anyway. Um, that proposed rule has been suspended along with many other rules um, by the current administration. We anticipate guidance coming soon. Um, SHRM, the US Chamber of Commerce, and a number of other like healthcare entities um, sent a letter to the EEOC asking them for guidance about this specific issue. And so I anticipate we will get that fairly soon. Um, and my final thing that I wanna point out is you also have to offer accommodations even under voluntary um, incentive plans. And so let's say you have somebody who can't get a vaccine because of allergies, that's an ADA issue, but let's say they still want the, um, uh, the benefit. And um, you have to consider things, ways that you could accommodate them. So it's the same process. And perhaps you could have them go through more training. Perhaps you could get them to take additional steps, um, like from the masking, social distancing, hand washing perspective. Um, if they watched a video, for example, they would get paid for that time, just like the person who goes and gets vaccinated is going to get paid. Um, they would probably not be able to take, they obviously would not be able to take part in any sort of mask-free rule down the road. And I wouldn't exactly institute, reinstitute the travel um, for these folks. Um, and likewise, Title VII, you're probably also going to have to offer those same types of um, accommodations. And with that, I'm going to turn it back over to you, Jason, um, so that we can hear from Larry. Thank you. Thanks, hey, job, Susan. And a few questions have come in um, related to your topic, Susan. So as soon as Larry's done, we'll circle back to you, and I'd love for you to address a couple of questions. Okay, great. Thanks. 
So with that, I'll turn the time over to Larry Irwin. Larry is a member of the firm's employment law team and is based in our Reno office. His practice focuses on a broad range of labor and employment related matters. Larry, I'll turn it over to you. All right, good morning, everyone. I'm going to be closing out the presentation today with a with a cover overview of uh, vaccination statistics, a very broad overview of the four states uh, immunity statutes, or in the case of Montana, their proposed immunity statutes. And I'm going to follow up with a specific example of a, a Nevada case. And if, if one were to hypothetically and uh, enact a mandatory policy, what would happen with a severe uh, reaction to that under the Nevada workers compensation laws? So, where are we? Uh, COVID, COVID vaccination statistics as of February 8th of uh, 21. Idaho, we can see the numbers there, first and second dose. Montana, first and second dose. Nevada, first and second dose. And then Utah, I was not able to determine first and second, but the total vaccines uh, administered. And why is this important? Because we all know, based on the earlier presenters, that the second dose is one where you are now considered uh, fully immunized. From a source I was able to look at on a poll, it looks at the Western states, uh, Montana, Nevada, Idaho, and Utah are averaging somewhere between 8.6 and 9.4% in terms of folks being fully immunized. So somewhere just around uh, 9%. Now I'm gonna uh, segue into a very broad overview of the four states immunity statutes and proposals. Of the four states, Idaho, Utah, and Nevada have coronavirus limited um, effective immunity acts. Montana has a proposal, which I'll discuss in just a minute, Senate Bill 65, which is uh, about to be passed any day now. The general theme that runs through these laws, which I think businesses can take heart in and be somewhat, uh, have a little bit of good news here, is that if you generally follow the controlling health standards set forth by the EEOC uh, uh, and the other uh, uh, the, the health departments and such, you're probably going to be immune from liability for a case of transmission in the workplace. And there are, of course, exceptions for intentional acts and things of that nature. So there is a little bit of good news here. Uh, this is the Idaho statute. And then we see that Montana uh, has the same thing, uh, and this, I, I'm told, is going to be passed any day now, and so that will be quite uh, important when that happens. And then we look to Nevada, Senate Bill 4, Section 29, and basically, if you're going to try to bring a lawsuit, and I must stress that this is untested thus far, as are, to my knowledge, most of the um, statutes in all four of the states, but if you generally follow the controlling health standards, your health, local health department, the CDC, you're, it's going to be very difficult for, for one to bring a, a lawsuit against you um, for a case of transmission in the workplace. And finally, we look at Utah's uh, statute and it follows the same general theme. Uh, you'll be generally be protected and immune unless it's a case of willful misconduct, reckless infliction of harm, or intentional. So the common theme here that we see is if you follow the controlling health standards and you're not doing anything exceptionally, you know, grossly negligent or somebody's doing something of an intentional nature, you will be protected um, from, for the most part, for, and immune from a lawsuit uh, for transmission in the workplace. I wanted to, because I was asked to bring up a particular example of, well, what if, what if you, considering the previous presenters and you've weighed all the facts and circumstances of your workplace and you've decided to enact a mandatory policy, the question you might have is, well, what happens if someone has a, um, a significant adverse reaction to that? Well, I would propose, and this is untested, but I think it's pretty good, pretty good, pretty solid, that that would most likely be a, uh, a workers' compensation case because you've made a determined condition, and the uh, the adverse reaction arose out of what's called the course and scope of employment. Um, so that would be a, a workers' compensation case. Can't speak to the other cases, but in in states, but in Nevada, that would certainly um, be the case. So at this point, I'd like to wrap it up and turn it back over to. Uh, Jason for the question and answer. Great, thank you very much, uh, Larry. Um, given um, that we've got about four or five minutes left, I'd love to invite all of our presenters back, um, if you would be so kind to turn on your cameras. Um, and I'd like to get to some questions here uh, that have come in from our audience. 
So why don't I start with Susan? Um, a couple came in during your section that I think are germane to what you were talking about, Susan. Um, for those that elected not to take the vaccine to, due to religious belief or disability, how would you handle any incentives in these cases so they are not negatively impacted? Um, yeah, it, it may have come in before my, my last slide, but um, you have to offer those incentives if they want them um, to people who are having or who need an accommodation and who get an accommodation. And as part of the interactive process, um, depending on what the incentive is, um, you look at how to, how to make sure that they can get it. And so you want to basically make it commensurate, like, so, okay, so someone's getting a vaccine, the vaccine's for safety, um, all of those things. What can this person do that will increase safety, decrease the risk from COVID in the workplace? Um, and that could be additional training. I mean, there's there's been a mention of like, watch a, watch a COVID video. I don't think that that's enough. Um, I think that that needs to be more than they've done already, um, but enough that they could get paid for that time maybe or get the incentive. Okay, thanks, Susan. I'm going to stick with you on this one as well. Okay. Can employers request that independent contractors, for example, IT consultants and other subs who work with employees get and show proof of the vaccination? That's an interesting question, and yes, um, you can require that people who come into your workplace get it. Um, and, and, and yeah, I think you can make that a part of your contract that you would get um, proof of it. If you have somebody who is an IT person, for example, and never comes into your workplace or is a remote worker, I don't think that that's something you want to push. Um, the reasoning just isn't there. But yeah, if you're in your workplace, for sure. There's okay. also some guidance um, that you have a joint responsibility for tight situations like that. Yep. Amy, this is a question I'll, I'll um, uh, put in in your lap. Um, can you address an employer's ability to not only encourage vaccination, but also incentivize employees by offering time off or gift cards? And I know Susan touched on this, um, so one of you can take this, but um, talk about the issue of gift cards. Susan can talk about gift cards. Um, my comment would only be, um, I think if the, if you're requiring and mandating the vaccine, that you need to give people um, the paid time off uh, in any event. And I think Susan mentioned this, but um, you should, it can be an incentive, but it's also probably required um, if someone has an adverse reaction, you need to give them the time off after. I can't remember if we had um, touched on that fully. Yeah, I think that's all right. In terms of gift cards, um, so gift cards right now fall into the unknown category. Well, not unknown. If, it, if it's a de minimis gift card, it definitely qualifies under the old rule. Um, the EEOC is not going to go lower than that, I don't think. I mean, I don't know how much lower you can get than a water bottle um, or a de minimis gift card. <laughs> but in terms of cash is king, um, gift cards are great. And I think we all look forward to getting EEOC guidance as to what their viewpoint is going to be in terms of the upper value. Um, the upper value we know can't be 30% because a court has already struck that down and told them no. Um, but maybe it's 20% you know, of the, the monthly cost of health care for that individual. So it's, a, it's an unknown right now. Gift cards are a great idea once we figure out what, how much they can be. Thanks, Susan. Thanks, Amy. Um, one last question, um, Amy, and, and let me let me um, start with you. In a voluntary program, does tracking increase the risk of a retribution claim? That is a good question. I would give the lawyer answer of it depends. Um, <laughs> do you have a highly litigious uh, employee workforce as it is. Um, I think you need to do some things. Um, if you receive the records, you need to make sure that they are, if they contain health information kept separately um, and not, you know, 
laid out on a table for everyone to see, um, that sort of thing. But I don't know um, the answer to if it will increase your chances of getting a claim. Anybody so else want to weigh in? I'll weigh in slightly here, or, or Liz may also be able to weigh in a little bit. I think um, there, you may get some pushback for people not wanting to give you a vaccine um, uh, card. If you offer any incentive whatsoever, they have to show you. If you've given time off, they've got to show you. Um, so I think that that's another reason to pay for the time off to you get it, is you will be able to gather these statistics about your workforce. And I, I think that that's a valuable explanation too of, hey, look, we want to be able to know how many of you are vaccinated, and we want to be able to communicate that to our customer base as well. Um, and it's valuable for A, B, C, and D reasons, you know? I think also it's important to uh, remind each of our attendees as employers and as business owners that just because you're documenting a specific policy or documenting a specific process, doesn't mean that you're increasing the likelihood of being sued and therefore shouldn't do it. You do always want to make sure that you are documenting your processes, that you're making sure your managers and your HR professionals are following those processes appropriately, and that they're implementing the procedures across the board among all employees correctly. And so you don't want to not do something just for fear of being sued, where building that um, that information or that documentation can actually help save you in the long run. As any of you who've come to our, our webinars over the years or our employment law seminars know, one of the very first things we tell you is we love paper. We want you <laughs> to have documented everything so that we have a big file to go through and show that what you did was correct. Thank you very much, Liz. And um, I'd like to extend a huge thanks to all of our presenters, Liz Mellum, Amy Lombardo, Susan Mottschiedler, and Larry Irwin. Thank you for your time, your insights, and preparation today. A big thanks to all of you who joined us um, for this morning's webinar. I know we provided you with a lot of information. Um, as I said from the outset, we will be providing you within 24 hours an email that will include a link to today's recording along with the PowerPoint presentation. And then for those of you that provided us with CLE um, or your bar numbers for CLE purposes, we will be submitting that on your behalf. Um, and lastly, um, given the complexities of, of vaccinations in the workplace, um, as we mentioned from the very beginning and as all of our presenters touched on, um, please, consult with legal counsel before making any decisions on how to address these issues within your workplace. Um, thanks again to all of you for joining us. Be safe and stay healthy. Thank you.